Hello everyone, hope that all of you are doing well. Now we are continuing our study through the book of Ephesians. And so today we're gonna to be looking at Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter one, verses three through 14. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna read the passage, we're gonna break it down. And in the end, we're gonna to try to answer the question, how does all of this apply to my life with where I am today? All right, so starting with verse three, it says this. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. So here, the Apostle Paul starts out by saying, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is Paul expressing here? Well, first of all, Paul is saying that God is worthy of our praise and that Jesus is God and Jesus is God's Son. All of this is evident to, uh, through Jesus, right? Through Christ and Christ alone. And so as Paul opens up his, his letter to the church in Ephesus, he is emphasizing the fact that this is all about Jesus. The gospel is all about Jesus, that we are saved through Christ, that we have salvation through Christ and Christ alone, and that all glory, all glory that goes to God comes through Christ and Christ alone. And he goes on, he says this, right? He says, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying this, when he talks about spiritual blessing, he's talking about forgiveness of sins. So what separates us from God? Our sin separates us from God. And it is because of our sin, because of our rebelliousness to God, we deserve eternal punishment from God. We deserve to be eternally separated from God. But it is through Christ, it is through Jesus that we receive forgiveness of sins. And it's because of this forgiveness of sin, because Jesus paid the price for our sins, we are no longer the object of God's wrath. We are no longer separated from God. We now have a relationship with God, and this relationship with God is now possible through Christ and Christ alone. So we walk with God. We have eternal life with God. And with that, we have an inheritance, right? And this inheritance is everything that God has to offer, every, every, everything. So we receive all of this through Jesus, right? Eternal life. Uh, spiritual blessings, just the opportunity to walk with God. All of this is possible through Christ and Christ alone. Verse four says this, for he chose, right? The word chose means selected. So God selected, God chose us in him through Jesus before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. Okay, so what does verse four mean? Verse four means this, that before the universe was created, before the universe was created, God chose us. If you are in Christ, God chose you before the foundations of the world was created. But what we do know here in this passage is, is that God chose us to himself through Jesus before the foundation of the world. Verse five says this, he predestined, in other words, God predetermined or God intended ahead of time. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. And so what we're seeing here is this, that God's grace through Jesus, right, through salvation, is on display when Jesus saves us. We go from being an enemy of God, being separated from God, to being a child of God. We go from not having a relationship with God to being a child of God and having this relationship with God and experiencing all the spiritual blessings that God has to offer. Now, God's grace is on display. That's what Paul is saying in verses five and six. God's grace is on display in our lives through Jesus. What exactly does that mean? Well, when, when Jesus saves us, this is all about God's grace. Salvation is not based on anything you do or anything that we try to achieve, but salvation is based on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Our salvation is by the work of God. It is, it, it is by God. God draws us to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about our lives, right, displaying the glory of God through Jesus, who we are in Christ, we are now a child of God. We are experiencing the spiritual blessings. We have this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. This displays 
who God is, his greatness, because now we're no longer an enemy of God, we're a child of God. The ways that we live for God, the ways that the Holy Spirit moves in our lives, this is all about the finished work of Christ in us. And it is, it is through Jesus that the glory of God is on display. Now, as we think about God's work on display, we need to remember that this is not about what you and I do to earn God's favor. This is not about you and me being good enough or doing enough or being involved in enough ministries or, or, or just being, being the right kind of person so that God would love us more. You see, when we talk about God's grace, God's grace is simply the fact that he is good, that before the foundation of the world, he chose us, not because he saw anything good in us, but simply because of his grace. And so when we are in Christ, when we look at our lives, when we examine our lives, when we see what we deserve, we deserve eternal separation from God. But in Christ, we are now saved. We have a relationship with God. We are, we, th this is a gift. And so when we receive this gift, we receive this gift simply because God is good and we are experiencing his grace. We do not deserve, we do not deserve salvation. We do not deserve eternal life. We do not deserve uh, wa walking with God for eternity. All the spiritual blessings, we do not deserve that. But when we are in Christ, when we're experiencing that, we, we recognize the grace of God. We see the grace of God in salvation. So when we experience this, this is God's glory and God's goodness on display in us through Jesus. Verse 7 says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the, for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. All right, so let's look to verse 9. Verse 9 says this, he made known to us the mystery, right? The mystery. What was the mystery? The mystery was simply this. How do we as humans get to God? How do we as humans get to experience all that God has to offer? And outside of Jesus, we're going to try everything possible. We're going to try to be good enough. We're going to try to be religious enough. We're going to try to pray more. We're going to try to read our Bible more. We're going to try to do more. But the more that we do outside of Jesus, we realize that the, even, even we, we can do as much as we want to do. But doing all of that will not get us to God. And so outside of Jesus, there is a mystery, right? The mystery is how do we get to God? But in Christ, in Christ, right? In Christ, that mystery, right? That mystery is revealed. We have a relationship with God, not by what we do, but we have a relationship with God by the finished work of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus died for us, he became sin for you and me. He suffered the wrath of God for our sins. He paid the price for our sins and he rose from the dead. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he has victory over sin and death. And when we surrender our lives to, to Jesus, when we repent of our sins, we receive forgiveness from God and we have this relationship with God. And so when we talk about the mystery, right? Mystery outside of Jesus, this mystery is something that we in the flesh cannot understand. We can't figure out. But in Christ, this mystery is revealed. Verse 10 says this, In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might also or might bring praise to his glory. Verse 13, in him you also were sealed with a promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Let's look at verse 13. Paul says this, In him you also were sealed. And so the word sealed, here's what it meant for the people at that time. Sealed simply meant that the owner put his signature on something that he owned. A seal indicated the authenticity of what was owned. So two things, right? There, the, the owner owned it and it is real, 
Okay, so if, if you put your seal on something as the owner, that meant that you owned it and it is real. And so in this context, Paul is saying in him, you also were sealed. So as a follower of Jesus, when Jesus saves us, right? When we, when we go from being an enemy of God, uh, from being separated from God to being a child of God, it is in Christ that we are sealed. So God is saying, you are my child and your salvation is for real. But how does God seal us? It says this, with the promised Holy Spirit, right? With the promised Holy Spirit. And so when we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this, being a Christian is, is not just a mental exercise. It's not just something verbally that we recite and we say, well, I believe in Jesus or I trust Jesus. It's more than just saying a prayer. It is, it is a life change. It is a, a, a commitment to Jesus. It is surrendering our lives to him. It is a transformation that takes place in our hearts and in our lives. It, it, we go from being an enemy of God and now through Christ, our sins are forgiven and we have a relationship with God. And when we have this relationship with God, the Holy Spirit fills us. And now we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So if you are a Christian today, if Jesus saved you, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in us gives evidence to the fact that we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We are sealed, right? The Holy Spirit identifies us with God as a child of God. And, and, and the Holy Spirit authenticates, authenticates our relationship with God. And then in verse 14, it says this, The Holy Spirit is a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of of his glory all right so the holy spirit is the down payment so here on here on this earth while we live in this broken world we experience partially the, all the, the fullness of god and and the holy spirit here on this earth we we are filled with the holy spirit right and so when we come to know jesus christ as lord and savior the holy spirit fills us and as we're walking with jesus we have the Holy Spirit in us and the Holy Spirit who is in us is a down payment in that because we are, we are God's children, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, this is a down payment. And this should assure us that because the Holy Spirit lives in us, we are sealed. We are God's, right? We're God's children. And this is real so that in the end, when we see Jesus face to face, we will experience the fullness, right? So right now, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you, that should serve as, a, as evidence that, hey, the Holy Spirit lives in me and I am a follower of Jesus. And one day, because of, because of this down payment or because of the evidence of, of, of the Holy Spirit in me, I know that when this life is over, I will continue to experience all the blessings that God had intended for those who believe. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, somewhere between 60 to 62 AD, while he was under house arrest in Rome. Paul was under house arrest in Rome for spreading the gospel throughout the known world, for raising up leaders, for starting churches, and as a result of his faithfulness to Jesus, he was put under house arrest. Still. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Christians at that time to trust Jesus, to hang in there with Jesus. And if you walk with Jesus, this is what the Christian life should look like. This is what the church should look like if you are walking with Jesus. And Paul also encouraged the church in Ephesus saying that if you follow Jesus, you, you have inheritance to all that God has to offer. As a follower of Jesus, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you no longer have to fight the spiritual forces in your flesh, but you have the, the, the Holy Spirit in you who will fight these battles for you, right? We depend on God um, through Jesus and it is through Jesus we, we, we have access to, to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit lives in us and the Holy Spirit fights these spiritual battles for us or the, the Holy Spirit uh, speaks to us, right? And guides us through these very difficult times. And so we see all of this. And so Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus while he was under house arrest in Rome. He was encouraging the Christians in Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, to hang in there with Jesus. Now, Christians in the church in Ephesus, um, they, if, if you were a follower of Jesus in Ephesus, 
you lived under pretty hostile conditions, right? Uh, people in Ephesus were, were pretty hostile towards Christianity. And, and some of the reason is this. Ephesus was a very influential city. Ephesus was also a, a city of of, of just immorality. Uh, the, there, there were temples that practiced temple prostitution. So uh, in worship, whatever happened, in, the act of prostitution was a part of worship. Um, immorality ran rampant in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was also a city of learning. The third largest library in the Roman Empire at that time was in Ephesus. And there was all kinds of trade and commerce that took place in Ephesus. You see, Ephesus was important for the Roman Empire because Ephesus connected Asia, connected the Middle East, connected Europe, connected Africa, because it, was, it brought the roadways together with, with every trade that happened on, on the ocean or on, uh, through, through commerce uh, through the sea, right? So there was, there was trading that took place. And so with all of that, Ephesus was very influential, and you can see how with, with this cosmopolitan mentality, how people would have been very hostile to the gospel. And so if you were a follower of Jesus, you would have come out of that. You would have come out of that culture. You are now part of the church in Ephesus. You're growing in Christ, and, but, but you're still facing some of these issues as you live everyday life in the world. And so there were probably Christians who wondered, how do you do that, right? How do you do, how do you live the Christian life out in the world? In addition to that, there were Christians who wondered, who wondered, I, I'm not feeling it right now. I, I'm, I'm facing all of this pressure from the world and I'm struggling in my faith. I'm struggling with sin. Um, in, in church, in church life, there may be some issues going on and just inside, I'm just, I don't know. I, I'm not feeling my walk with God. Am, am I a Christian? Am I saved. And here the apostle Paul immediately goes off and he says, if Jesus saved you, here's why you can be confident. If Jesus saved you, know that you are blessed, right? Know you are blessed. You know, this speaks into where you may be right now. There's some of you, you're living your life and you are living in a culture that that, that as you live your life for God, it may be hard. We, we see challenges in our media. We see challenges in education. We see, we see challenges at work. And as we see all of these challenges, right, even with family and friends and teammates, if you play sports, classmates, if you go to school, all of these challenges make it very difficult for us to, to find confidence in who we are in Christ. And that may lead people to wonder, Am I really a Christian? Did Jesus really save me? Well, the Apostle Paul in verses 3 through 14, he says, When we are in Christ, we are blessed. When we are in Christ, we can be secure. We can be assured that Jesus saved us. And so he gives us several examples here. He gave several examples of the church in Ephesus, to the Christians in Ephesus. But at the same time, these apply to us. These apply to where we are today. All right. So let me just share with you a few things that, that Paul shared it, as, as we think about our own walk with God and how we can be confident in who we are in Christ, right? So he shares four things uh, from this passage. Number one, when we are in Christ, we are chosen, right? When, when you and I are in Christ, we are chosen. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says that God chose us before the foundation of the world. In verse 5, he said that God predestined us to be adopted. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul said that we were predestined according to his will. We predestined according to the will of God. And so what we see here is that, is that throughout eternity, God who is sovereign, he chose us. Right? He chose us. He chose you and he chose me. Right? God is sovereign over salvation. What this does not mean is this. It does not mean that we are robots or that God is fatalistic. But what this shows us is this, that God's sovereignty, right? that God has control, God is all powerful, that nothing happens outside of God's design and God's plan and his will. Nothing happens outside of God's sovereignty even salvation, but in speaking about God's sovereignty over salvation, this doesn't mean that we're robots. What this means is that even in the midst of God's sovereignty, you and I are responsible to choose God, right? So God's sovereignty and our responsibility to choose, that goes hand 
in hand. Now, I know some of you may be saying, well, that, that doesn't make sense. Well, that is the big mystery, right? How, how that works. And there is so much about God. There's so much about the mind of God. There's so much about how God, who God is that we do not understand. But as we read scripture, we see this part of scripture where it says that God is sovereign even over salvation. So we, we trust that. There are other parts in scripture that talk about our responsibility as, as followers of Jesus to spread the gospel. Um, we must spread the gospel. There is also human responsibility in choosing Christ for salvation. So we teach in all of that, but in the midst of all of this, right? So God's sovereignty over salvation, our human responsibility to choose, human responsibility to spread the gospel. There's a mystery. But what we do know is this, that in everything that scripture teaches, we must be faithful. Right? And then um, what we also see is this, that salvation is God's work. Salvation is by the work of God. We cannot earn salvation. And in the same way that you and I can not earn salvation, we cannot undo what God already did. So if God chose you, if you're in Christ, if God saved you through Jesus, you, can't un you cannot undo your salvation. Number two, when we are in Christ, we are adopted into God's family. Right? We are adopted into God's family. That's what Paul speaks about in, in verse 5. We are adopted into God's family. What does it mean to be adopted into God's family? simply means this, that before Jesus, you and I were once enemies of God. But in Christ, in Christ, we have the full status and we can receive the full blessing of what it means to be a child of God. We have access to God. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says that as followers of Jesus, as God's children, we have received or we received the inheritance, everything that God offers through Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul says this, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. In other words, Jesus paid the price for you and me. He paid the price for your sins and mine. Jesus became sin for you and me and suffered the wrath of God for our sins. The, the price that you and I should have paid for our sins, Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. And, and so Jesus... Jesus paid the price for our sins through his blood. And it says this, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. This is all by God's grace, all right? Number three, when we are in Christ, we walk with God. When you and I are in Christ, we walk with God, right? So isn't that awesome? I mean, just to know that we were once enemies of God, but in Christ, we are now children of God. And we have this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to throw out a few verses for us to understand the significance of that. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, Isaiah writes this. He says that God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And as far away as the heavens are from the earth, so are God's ways and thoughts different from ours, right? And when you think about how vast and big and huge our universe is, it, I don't think we can even comprehend how big our universe is. I, I don't think we can comprehend how far away the heavens are from where we are. So when we look at that, we can see that the mind of God is so much more different than our mind. The, the will and the intention of God, what God knows is far different than anything we know. And so for you and me to try to, to, to figure out what God is thinking or why God does what he does, we will never be able to figure that out. That is a mystery. But it also, um, um, 1 Corinthians 1.18 <laughs> goes on to say this, the message of the cross is foolishness to those outside of Jesus. So when we think about God, his, his greatness and who he is, and when we read scripture, we say, well, I, I see this, but I don't understand how it applies. There's so many questions of why we, we can't understand the mind of God. We, we have a hard time understanding salvation, that salvation is only through Christ and Christ alone. Well, in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, Paul emphasizes that fact by saying that the message of the cross, the message of the gospel through Christ and Christ alone is foolishness to those who do not know Jesus. So the way that God would save us and bring us to himself would be through his son, Jesus. But that is foolishness to the world. And so Paul is saying that this message, this message doesn't make sense. But in Christ, in Christ, we, we begin to understand the heart of God. 
we begin to understand the, the will of God, the plans of God, the purposes of God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says this, and this is for those who believe, those who trust Jesus. We're now filled with the Holy Spirit. We have a relationship with God through Jesus. Paul says to not be conformed by the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Right? So we don't conform any longer because our natural flesh wants to conform to the patterns of this world. But we are transformed through the gospel. We're transformed by the Holy Spirit in us. We're transformed through the word of God, God's very word. And as we continue to walk with God, as we continue to talk with God, as we continue to grow in this relationship, uh, we understand more and more the heart of God, the mind of God. We become more and more here on this earth. While we're alive here on this earth, we become more and more a reflection of God's work in us. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 8, Paul said that God pours on us wisdom and understanding. God pours on us his wisdom and understanding, right? So this is something that we do not gain on our own, but this is something that God pours out on us, in us, as we grow in our relationship with him. Ephesians chapter 1 9 says, He, God, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ. And so God made known to you and me, right? He's continued to make known to you and me his mystery, his purpose, but it's about walking with Jesus. Outside of Jesus, we're going to try to figure it out and we'll never figure it out. But as we are walking with God through his son, Jesus Christ, the mysteries of God, his heart, his mind are more and more revealed to us. Number four, last thing, when we are in Christ, we are sealed. Right? When we are in Christ, we are sealed. Ephesians 1.13 says that we are sealed. As followers of Jesus, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And when we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit within us. Right? So there is a, we, there's salvation that happens within us. We have a new heart. We have a new mind. We have a new attitude. The ways that we now express ourselves become a reflection of the finished work of Jesus in us. We think differently. We... we go about about what we do differently because of the transformation through the gospel that has happened in our hearts. And so there's a gospel transformation through the Holy Spirit within us. But there's also transformation that takes place outwardly, right? So on the inside, the Holy Spirit continues to change us and renew us and will cause us to see the Bible in ways that we've never seen, will cause us to respond to people in ways that we've never responded before, or maybe in ways that were challenging for us. And through the Holy Spirit, we act differently. Uh, we relate to people differently, right? Because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our minds and in our hearts. So when the Holy Spirit lives in us, we have an inward, an inward change because of salvation that has taken place through Jesus. In Christ, we have a relationship with God, but in Christ, we're also filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's a change that happens in us. And now we have a relationship with God and we have eternal life through Jesus. We're going to be walking with God for eternity. No one can take that away. But as we're walking with God, there is an outward expression of this inner reality. There's a way that we're going to act towards other people. There's a way that people are going to see us. And this transformation is not by our own power and our own strength, but it's because of the finished work of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to live outwardly the inner reality of the gospel. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? So when we, think, when we talk about being sealed with the Holy Spirit, it is not that... It, it, it's not about getting all emotional or, um, you know, just jumping up and down and, and doing all, just getting crazy, right? It's not about that. But, it, but it's about some, it's about a change. It's about the fullness that happens in your heart. It's about understanding who God is. It's, it's about living under the power and authority of God through his spirit. And when we experience that, when we experience that, we will know that, wow, Jesus saved me. And because Jesus saved me, the Holy Spirit lives in me. And this, the Holy Spirit is evidence that I know Jesus. This is a seal, right? Seal. We, God shows his ownership on us based on the seal that comes through the Holy Spirit. Now, 
As I talk about all of this, right, when we're in Christ, we're chosen. When we're in Christ, we're adopted into God's family. When we're in Christ, we walk with God. When we're in Christ, we are sealed. I know that as, as I'm saying this, as we're teaching this, some of you may be out there and you're saying, well, but you know what, James, that's all good. I know that. I've studied that, but I'm just not really feeling it inside. I'm not feeling salvation inside. And right now, you may be where you are and you may be wondering, do I even know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Let me just share a few things with you uh, before we go. You need to know that salvation is not a feeling. Salvation is more than just words that we speak that never really connected with our hearts. Salvation is something that you and I cannot work towards. So salvation is about the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And so today, as you're evaluating your life, as you're thinking about your life, and, and, and as you're thinking about maybe feeling or sensing a disconnect from God, sensing this dryness from God, uh, for some today, you may never have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe you went to church, you're involved in ministry, you, you read your Bible, you pray, you go through the motions. But it was all about these outward acts, but your outward acts never reflected an inner reality. And maybe for some of you, as you, you evaluate your heart, you will, you will recognize that, wow, I haven't, I haven't trusted Jesus. I haven't trusted his finished work on the cross. That may be you right now. If that is you, I want you to, to just go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I know that I've sinned, and, and not just with your mouths, but this needs to come from your heart. This needs to be an expression of your heart, saying, Jesus, I, I know that I've sinned. I know that I have rebelled against you. I, I have sinned, and because of my sin, I deserve eternal separation from you. And as you're praying, as you're praying, acknowledge Jesus' death on the cross for your sins and mine. Acknowledge that he became sin for you and me, that he suffered the wrath of God, the, the, a wrath that you and I should have suffered but Jesus paid the price for you and me. And, and, and believe that Jesus rose from the dead and surrender your life to Jesus today. Surrender to him. And when you, when you, you acknowledge Jesus as Lord, when you surrender to him, when you trust Jesus, the finished work of Jesus on the cross, know that it is because of what Jesus did and, be, and it's because of your belief, your trust in Jesus, it is simply that, right? That, that Jesus saves you, but it's trusting the work of Jesus on the cross. Maybe that's you today. Maybe there are others. You are a Christian. You know Jesus as Lord and Savior, and, and, and Jesus really did save you, but you're not experiencing the, the, the joy, the fullness of, of what it means to walk with Jesus. Several things. First of all, you, you, you are a Christian, but your life is, you're not, you're not, you're not pouring into this relationship with God. Now we know that, that salvation is by Christ and Christ alone, but we also have our responsibility to grow in Christ. It is about, it is about spending time with God, being in his word and prayer and, and, and just making a commitment to grow in him. And maybe that's you, maybe that's you. It is simply surrendering to that. Maybe there are others today. You are a follower of Jesus, but you have allowed everything that the world offers to control you more than Jesus. And today may be a time where you surrender it all to Jesus. You know in your heart that Jesus saved you. In fact, as we're going through this passage, the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, you are a child, you are a child of God. And so will, will you, will you just surrender it all to Jesus today? It's not by what you do, right? Sometimes we think that if I do more, if I go to church more, if I be better if I if I do good then maybe God's gonna love me more God already loves you the issue is are we gonna simply surrender to Jesus many of you already know that that doing more will not satisfy the longing in your heart being a better person will not satisfy the longing in your heart it is simply Jesus it is surrendering to Christ and Christ alone will you do that as we as we examine our hearts, right? Let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to gather together like this. Lord God, I thank you for Paul and his commitment to you, uh, his commitment to writing this letter, even while he was under house arrest. Father, I pray for anyone right now who is struggling in his or her walk with you. There may be Christians right now who are just feeling spiritually dry and disconnected. Lord God, if you save them, 
Lord God, we pray that, that they would just turn to you and say, God, um, I, I want to surrender. I want to I wanna lay my life before you. I want to just lean into the gospel that saved me. Today, there may be others who don't know Jesus Christ and Lord, as Lord and Savior. We pray that today will be the day that they surrender their hearts to you, God, through Jesus Christ. We lift up all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.